Okay, hello, Melissa Gwynn. Hello, Helen Pluckrose. Nice to see you. <laughs> uh, and thank you for agreeing to, to speak to me. I saw your um, visual statement about freedom of, of speech and um, I, I found it so moving. And I, I think we're hearing increasingly from artists of, of all kinds, um, everyone from um, filmmakers to musicians to painters, that there's that there's a problem with freedom of expression at the moment and that people aren't really recognising the full ramifications of limiting creativity. So I wanted to show people your your video and then ask you to explain a bit more about it. So shall we first have a look at the video? Let's do that. Yeah. I am Melissa Gwynn and I teach drawing and painting at UC Santa Cruz in California. I'm an abstract painter who believes it's not possible to make an abstract painting and a representational painter who teaches artists to break down any painting to its abstract formal elements. In my courses, I prompt students to reinforce their individual way of seeing by analyzing the formal structure of their pieces. Fluency in formal language enables one to articulate their ideas and contribute to a continuum of artists who created meaning through visual statements. I witnessed the power of visual language in the late 80s when illiberal senators and preachers tried to control it. Artists mobilized to protect free speech from Republicans who decried some contemporary art and artists they found contemptible. I guess the art made them feel unsafe. Those poor sanctimonious patriarchs created quite a moral panic that led to defunding significant art institutions and individual artist grants. Despite the damage those illiberal folks rendered, artists exercised their free speech and made exuberant art fueled by creative opposition. My belief in the power of art comes with concern about the vulnerability of the First Amendment and a sense of responsibility to protect it. Because if we value freedom of art and ideas that we love, then we must also protect speech that we despise. As Ira Glasser said, speech restrictions are like poison gas. They seem like a good idea when you've got the gas and a deserving target in sight. But as he noted, the wind can shift and blow the poison back on you. Let's protect the air for freedom of expression and uphold your right to listen to ideas so offensive. They impel you to draw upon your fluency in formal language to articulate a compelling, maybe even beautiful visual retort. Thanks so much for listening. Melissa, can you tell us what, why, why did you make that? Who, who is Melissa Gwynn and why does this matter so much to you? Um, so I'm, I'm a visual artist, I'm a painter. I am um, someone who started teaching art to youth um, when I was a youth. Um, I started teaching art at 16. Um, after graduate school, when I was no longer quite the youth, um, I was in my early 30s, I was teaching art in um, the public schools and usually um, sent to the neighborhoods that um, were most challenged and where the school districts were, were um, failing or, or where there were um, problems in the neighborhoods. And so um, I and other artists who were referred to as visiting artists uh, were, were sent to these um, neighborhoods in the metropolitan area. And it was a very interesting experience. And uh, the work that we were doing was basically um, community-based art. 
um, art that was designed to teach the children perhaps about math, but through using art or about social studies, but through using art. And, and um, it, was a really, it was a really valuable experience. And uh, through that experience, it was completely enriching to my art practice. Um, many years later, I guess it wasn't until I was 43 years old um, that I got a tenure track position and eventually received tenure at UC Santa Cruz, where I teach, um, I don't know, I think I'm biased, but I think some of the, the most wonderful people in the whole world, the students at UC Santa Cruz, um, and they're, they're, you know, they're really um, creative. They're a joy, they're a joy to work with. Um, but, but I'm concerned about a tendency in, that comes you know, from arts institutions that then affects university institutions to limit instruction. Uh, now, and, and so I've, I've done a little bit of digging um, to understand why that would be. And, um, and I think that um, part of the reason is because um, like many universities, the University of California is a public institution. And when you read the mission of public institutions, the final sentence is to serve the public good. And so art yeah. institutions are challenged, have always been challenged to get funding but um, I believe in recent years, they've found a way to, to um, get more funding by saying, we'll, we'll show you how we do public good. We are going to repackage the arts so that our arts are serving social justice and environmental justice and Professors of art, we'd prefer you to, you know, get on get on board with this program, and and students are are invited to get on board for that program too. But what happens is that um, then the offerings of art classes becomes limited. So that's a problem. And um, then secondly, um, I've been reading just the general reports and, you know, interpreting graphs uh, about censorship and, you know, in universities and censorship just in, you know, the broader, I'll just say American culture and that um, censorship is on the rise and self-censorship among students is very high. And, and so I wanted to create a, a statement to perhaps release some of the pressure that students are feeling. But then I have, a, I have a second motivation, which is to say that the impulse behind that drive to censor is conservative. And that's why I use the, the buffoons that were outspoken cultural figures in the late 80s, Jesse Helms, um, um, uh, and later I'm going to get into Rudy Giuliani, um, who was also a great censor. Um, historically, those who are aligned with, with the values of censorship are not 
they're obviously not liberal, but they didn't used to be progressive. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I just want to give a historical perspective and, and show a snapshot of a moment that made a great impression on me. And when I saw those three cultural figures, Jesse Helms and Reverend Wildman, who attempted to, you know, censor artists, I said at that moment, I don't, I don't want to be like them, mm. right? And so there's an implicit message in my video, which is, if you are participating in the censorship of others, you are not alone in that act. You are in the room with Jesse Helms. You're in the room with these conservative senators and Christian right, you know, religious figures. And, and I, I used to feel so much rancor for the conservative Christian right, especially during the George Bush administration. I've, I've, I've mellowed a little bit, but I still, I still have um, great um, um, hostility for those New York, the, those um, senators. So we, we've heard before that, that people have spoken of um what the the kind of censorship we're seeing as a, a new puritanism and i i think there's there's certainly a a, a sense of that and it, are you finding your your students themselves sort of overthinking and self-censoring um before they they put you know brush to paper i hope not i i I find in my classes that I, I create a reckless space. I don't create a safe space. I like to create a sort of wild, maybe a reckless space where people are, are invited and celebrated for taking chances. When I was a student, the word in art school was you take risks. That's the word that was valorized. And then there was a word that meant um, you're not a good artist, you're not a rigorous thinker. And that word was safe. Oh, so you're gonna do something safe, are you? Well, not interesting, not good art. And so how, how that word safe has reached this level of, of um, to be you know, celebrated is a very, very interesting surprise for me. And I have to say, it's not intriguing, it's upsetting, mm -hmm. but it's interesting. And it's something that I'm going to keep exploring. Why, why does our matter melissa what 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 does art mean to humans why is it so important that we can express through art there are times you take a walk and you look at a cruddy apartment building and you say god i hate cruddy apartment buildings and then you look at it more carefully and someone <laughs> has taken their lousy balcony and installed it with, you know, beautiful flowers, right? A beautiful planting, a beautiful garden. Um, I know it when I see it and there's art there, right? Okay. Um, and, then, um, and then you go home and to your surprise, your sweetheart has prepared dinner for you. And it's, it's not only smells good, it's not only your favorite food, but it's arranged on the plate. 
in a beautiful way. And, and it makes you feel awe. And it makes you feel more hungry too, and that's part. But there's art, there's art there, right? And then let me get to the, the recklessness and the wildness and the things that I value and I try to create the conditions for in my student studios. Um, you're at a wedding and people are dancing and things are dispersing and then all of a sudden a little three-year-old gets up from the table and you know she's dancing near the table but she's feeling the music and she's moving in a way that we've all forgotten how to move. And it's so original and it's, and it's, and art is moving through her. And that is art, right? Um, yeah. And then, and then, so what is the other part of art? Um, you know, it's the audience. It's the people who say, oh, I'm not an artist, you know, but they can't walk by that person's balcony and not say, good job with your garden. Thank you, right? It's like, we're, we're, we're participating just by viewing it and, and feeling uplifted by it. And, you're participating in art by taking that meal and, and saying, oh my God, it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's almost too beautiful to eat, but now I'm going to eat it. And I thank you and I love you for doing that for me. There's, that's an audience and that's participation. And, and then, you know, and this happened at, at a family wedding and it was with the three-year-old just, just, getting on the floor, not in the light, but just started dancing so beautifully. And everyone else on the dance floor and, and people at the bar and people at, you know, eating their meals got up and slowly, delicately gathered around so respectfully, not to make herself conscious in that moment, but just to bear witness to that moment of, art and um that's that's part of my definition i think the I was, yeah I, I was watching recently and i have a, a sort of layman's interest in early humans and i was um looking recently at that at, um the when neanderthals and homo sapiens coexisted and they, they seem to have had similar intelligence mm -hmm. but the evidence um seems to suggest that um, neanderthals didn't have um much in the way of imagination they didn't believe, leave behind any drawings. They didn't um, bury or, or have any rituals around their dead. That there, there was something there that Homo sapiens had of needing to, to leave a mark, to create, to symbolize, um, that was missing in the Neanderthals. And I, I find, do you, do you think this is an element of, of, our, of our human nature our 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 need to to create and express with our with our hands to symbolize something that we that we just must do whether we I am not um artistically gifted myself but that need to create I do it in in words um is is that us is that who we are I think that's essentially who we are and and it's a, it's a statement that at at this moment in time i'm alive mm -hmm. you know and it's a and whether there's an audience present or not it there is an art impulse um, behind that. Um, 
Now, the leaving of a trace of that moment, then that starts to um, lead to the trail of a practitioner and of, of, and of, an in, of intent. Um, but certainly some of the oldest um, records of, of um, painting or printmaking um, that I've seen, um, which was just um, um, a hand with pigments marking around it, a hand on a, on a stone wall. And then the artist spit um, root, root juice around the hand and leave, using the hand as a stencil. And it's, uh, it's such a marvelous thing to me, but it, you know, in terms of how, how it, it lasted, and that's, that's because of um, some kind of processes and the precipitation in the, the cave that brought um, the chemical lime to seal it so that, you know, we see it many generations later. But it wasn't until I had a little bit of time to think about it, which was, it's also about speech if you think about it in that with exhale, you know, there's exhale breath. It's a, it's a kind of exhalation and, and like, a, well, like an almost an exaltation of, of saying I'm alive. It's, it's really beautiful. <laughs> it's really, it was powerful to see that. Um, so then, so then what does it mean then to say, well, I'm alive. It's like, well, we are hideous sinners. We are troubled creatures. We are imperfect. And um, our thoughts go in all kinds of directions that some are very troubling. Some are, are impolite. And um, and we have to, artists have to allow for a certain um, cognitive liberty. I guess your friend Peter uh, Bogosian uses that term that resonates with me. Um, cognitive liberty before even freedom of speech. You have to, have to be able to um, feel able, uncrippled, un, unrestrained. Um, from, from being genuine and um, authentic, which I mean on, by authentic, I mean honest, honest with oneself in order to find the materials for good art, good art. At Aereo, we, we published a piece by a, a psychologist um, making a psychological argument for saying for, for freedom of speech, saying unless we can speak, we can't think. We cannot think things through. We we cannot be mentally well. We cannot be be whole because quite often we understand what we mean as we are speaking. Yes, and I think that that ties in with with uh, with art as as well if um if we cannot create then we cannot really know what we're experiencing or what we're thinking or what we're feeling as as individuals and collectively as a culture mm -hmm. as well so what what do you see as the, as the greatest threat to artistic freedom i mean i i can tell you the very sort of practical threats that that I see at at counterweight. Um, I um, you know a, a musician has come to me saying that she was not chosen to join an orchestra because her identity was um, she she was picked at the post although she was a woman of color she wasn't a queer woman of color. And the orchestra had um, complained because she was actually the superior pianist. And um, 
we've had um, book publishers saying that they cannot publish um, certain books, booksellers saying if they um, stock the work of JK Rowling, they will be called out publicly within the, the industry. Other people will be too afraid to do business with them. They won't be able to continue. And um, we've we've had writers. I've ha I've had a couple of of writers. Some of them quite quite famous, saying, I, "I want to write this book, but I know what will happen if I do, and I am afraid." Are you are you seeing a similar thing in art? What what do you think is this is this force which is is constraining art at the moment? It. It's avoiding a, it's, it's avoiding a great truth, which is we're attracted to finding the best. Um, you go to the farmer's market, you don't, you don't see people saying, oh, it won't be, it isn't fair to this farmer if I go to to the other table and buy the apples it's it's like even though those other apples are you know have a reputation for being the best it's like we don't we don't question merit at those times um it's it causes something worse than great confusion it's it's such a contradiction to ask educators to reject merit uh, or certainly someone who's been involved in education for as many years as I have um, then what in the world do you select by um, certainly people use the metaphors of you know of or the examples of athletics um, it seems like merit is not questioned there. Why not? Mm -hmm. I don't understand that. It's be, you know, maybe it would be interesting if, if we required, you know, consistency throughout culture, then, then we'd get some very interesting arguments from athletics. Um, you know, I've been told by students who are, um, in the LGBT community for a number of years. Who, you know, quite honestly, some of them are just, they are often, you know, like the super strong artists, right? Um, and, um, and they get in shows and they show their, and they say, well, you know, they ask me often. They often ask me for my advice and um, I always give it you know, saying, I'll, I'll give it as long as you're comfortable rejecting it, right? And so I always say, show your strongest work. This might be your one opportunity, but if it take it, it might lead to more. Show your best work. And so they do that, and they're asked by the curator if they couldn't show this other piece because it has more to do with identity politics. Mm. And so then they realize it's like, oh, oh, so my invitation, even though I'm a damn good artist, this invitation was contingent upon reinforcing uh, a message um, reinforcing a, a kind of political message. And it's so insulting mm. to those artists. And it was so insulting to that musician. Yeah. And, and so, um, oh yes, I mean, that's, that's a big problem. Yeah. Art, artists of any, of any identity should not be constricted to simply um, represent um, what a, 
you know, culture expects what a what an academic culture expects them mm. or would hope them to present. Yeah. It's coercive. It's coercive to do it. And once again, it it absolutely deadens audience participation. I, th I think that that we see this at the moment because of the the ideology which ties knowledge and and lived experience to identity so closely. So there is this idea that that all you can express is is not anything that that is individual, but that comes from being a woman or being a person of color or being a trans person. Or you, there's there's something um, authentic in producing some political statement according to that, but something less authentic in producing something that comes from your own individual imagination and, and spirit. Okay, first of all, how can one use the word authentic when they're asking people to be false? or to adopt on a small portion of what it is to be alive at this moment. That's, don't call it authentic, call it, um, um, can you please be a small portion? You know, that, that would be more honest. It, authenticity means realness, something genuine. How did that word get, inverted into becoming the the absolute antonym of its original definition it's fascinating <laughs> it's interesting um also and i'm sure other people have pointed this out but um lived experience that seems like that seems like a play that seems like a good play to give at a summer camp you know at summer camp around the campfire it's like oh you right i mean it's ridiculous how do you not how do you portray experience by not living it, it's it's um laughable terminology it's the material that's that's that should be lampooned <laughs> And that it is lampooned. It is smiled at. There are collective eye rolls among the very people who helped to put the ideology in place in academia. Mm. There are words in this ideology, by the way, that are definitely getting retired, mm -hmm. which is interesting. Okay. Yeah, but I, it's rather complicated, but it's something that I'm, I've been observing and writing about for a long, 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 long time, long time. <laughs> Okay, well, let, let's get down then to, to something more sort of um, solid that, that people can grasp. Let's, let's move yeah. into sort of analytical realm. I, I was particularly interested when um, we spoke before that, that you'd said that within your field now there are, are four forbidden words. And those four forbidden words are, are stifling artistic expression. Can you, can you tell us what those words are and, and why they're important and how it's working to stifle art? Okay. It's been a while since I, since I thought about it, but I made a point of using for a few words that are actually called into question. Um, and so one, I was very pointed about using the word individual um, because my education and in and my teaching philosophy, I, I really stress individual agency. 
and with agency comes opportunity, but also also um, responsibility. So agent, so individuality is is um, it is a part of being an artist, and one can use a great big soggy whitewash sponge and try to change it, but but they can't. It's 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 the individuality that that drives an artist forward for and sure it's frowned upon now um i would say between um 2009 and 2019 definitely um and so when when i created a class um yes okay so yes I, it's been frowned upon. It hasn't been, um, it hasn't been censored. Uh, there's no uh, punishment around that. It, there's just a sort of um, chuckling, let's say, and I would probably imagine that um, using that word puts you in the category of being an unserious academic yeah. at one time. Some kind of naive realist. Yeah, and conservative. All oh, right. It seems conservative. Okay, well, what was another word? Um, meaning. Oh, oh God, I used the word meaning. And um, I created a course about six years ago. And when I described that um, at a at academic gathering, um, I heard the disparaging remarks for using the word meaning. And so I liked that. I thought, oh, I'm on, I'm on the right track. And something else that I like about using that word is that it's such a part of colloquial speech, if you know what I mean, right? We're not, we're not saying um, my content, if you understand my content, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, so that was one of the, one of the words. Um, mm -hmm. Formal elements form to speak about the importance of the elements of design and, and to, teach students how to um, to manipulate, to understand, to practice, and to manipulate um, the, the elements of form. It's, it, is, it is like acquiring a language. And, and, um, and, with, and with fluency, in that language comes um, incredible um, confidence and authority, authority over one's ideas. Um, uh, uh, you know, so that's how I mean, that's how I mean authority. And so, so it's this um, formality, is this sort of formal elements is being able to, br to break down the work and, and um, describe in um, technical artistic terms what um, each part is and how it works. Correct. So we have line, shape, colour, value is a word that describes um, darks and lights. Um, and then we have the principles of design, which can have to do with, with balance, with rhythm, et cetera. And, and once a student understands the elements and the principles of design or collectively that's formal language, then they have the opportunity if they're diligent and if they you know are are disciplined in their practice they have the ability um to to have um 
independence, independence as an artist. And, and if they understand the formal elements, they can actually step back from their work and criticize and analyze their own work. So, so there's, so there's a, a part in, in um, teaching an artist that I think is, is, is maybe the most ethical part of what I do is teaching them to become independent and, and giving them the tools for self-critique. And, and um, that's really important. Uh, it's a tiring word, but I'd rather use the word agency as, a, as opposed to empowering. <laughs> <laughs> but agency and 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 authority over one's work mm -hmm. and and um the 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 sense of of um optimism that comes from learning how to make something right and and to have a relationship with one's work to eventually, you know, maybe not fall in love, but to have a have a, a an affiliation with their practice um, that that gives information back to the artist, right? Mm -hmm. And and so to take once uh, one step further, the idea of visual language, it's creates an opportunity for, for a dialogue between the artist and their work, mm -hmm. whether that's drawing, painting, any, any, any form. And um, that once again is about elevating the individual. Mm -hmm. Is is that why it's it's seen as a a problem? Um, and is is there an element that this is holding people to certain standards understood to be objective? You mean because the the standards are objective? Yes, I mean, is is that whole sort of objectivity? This this having a this is um, these are the elements. These are the way to understand them. This you can interrogate your own work. You can see it in a a different light. Stand back from it if if you're able to do that. Is that seen as as problematic? I can't imagine why it would, but it probably is because our times so are so ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, but it's so essential for an artist who's invested in their work uh, because that investment is also emotional and we want our work to succeed. And sometimes we have to get a body's length away from our work. And I actually, that's something I teach. It's like, however tall you are, you step back that length. And it's just like symbolic about just getting away from yourself and attempting, and this is, this is merely an attempt, but an attempt to um, analyze what's happening in, in one's piece and being able to apply um, self-criticism and, and lose, eventually lose their dependence on the mentor to tell them if they're doing well or not. And, um, and that's, and when you see that, and you can see that happening, glimmers of that happening in, you know, just a 10 week class sometimes, you know, that students will step back and they'll say, I think I understand my problem now. You know, that's, that's so great. That is so great. To see that. Is, is this is this frowned upon this um, focus on formal elements? <laughs> it really has been, and it makes no sense. <laughs> it just, you know what? I've been teaching for twenty, um, yeah, twenty years, and I still can't find a good explanation for that, except that. If you have an understanding of formal elements, then you have a greater likelihood of making a work that's beautiful. 
<laughs> or you have the likelihood of being able to create something that's 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 aesthetic that's powerful. and that's your your fourth word isn't it beauty that, yeah and that of course that... is the most dangerous one right because beauty is distracting right and and if and if students you know get absorbed in their work and and have that experience of you know like one out of nine paintings all of a sudden just hits it and it's beautiful and it's powerful well it's such an inducement to keep working and it's such an enticement to keep working and i remember this in graduate school where that 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 sense of communion with one's practice that relationship with the one's practice that inducement to keep going with your work was often um trivialized as being one is merely seduced they're seduced you know by their work like okay so seduction is wrong hmm? <laughs> wrong okay so then let's say that you really get involved with your work and you make a piece that's almost it's so beautiful it's 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 you know it's just induces temptation let's say let's say it's like all of a sudden you've created your your Botticelli's Primavera you know lucky you right <laughs> but uh, you've you've made a piece it's so beautiful and and then that could really get the hackles up of some in the anti-aesthetic community who, who who would refer to that level of engagement as um as guess what something dirty masturbation right Oh, well, it's, you know, you got so involved in your work, so involved in your relationship with your work, so engaged by materials that it's, that it's masturbatory. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until six years after I got out of graduate school that I finally made a painting about that moniker reserved for artists who are seduced to um, go further with their work. But here's the deal. Um, what's frightening about masturbation? Well, I heard, at least in the past, it could make you go blind, <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> okay, if you masturbate, you'll go blind. Um, what is the other fear? I don't, I don't know. I guess you're withdrawing from the public and you're not working with, with the group towards greater social good because you're there working on your painting, you, you, you know, naughty sensualist, right? It's once again, what you brought up early in our conversation, um, it's the, the, the Puritanism. And, and, and here's the deal, those Puritans would never have seen themselves in the same camp as Jesse Helms and Re Reverend Wildman, two of the three conservatives featured in my video. They would never, they would be so offended, but they are absolutely in the same camp condemning sensuality, condemning masturbation, for heaven's sake, condemning sin in art, and seeing, um, you know, thorough, authentic, engaging with art, problematizing it as the sin of, of masturbating. Analyze that. Whoa. Anyway. 
There is. I wonder if this is, we, we had, uh, you know, I, I studied late medieval, early modern um, um, texts. And we had um, this uh, lecture and um, had to read about the problem of uh, fetishizing the yeah. texts and <laughs> what this what this means. And I, I see. I, I don't know if I'm I'm tapping into the same thing that you're that you're talking about. But when I'm looking at a, a manuscript that was written in the late medieval period, or I'm looking at an early modern book which has been handmade and put together and I can see how it's it's been done and it's been hand written and I can see where somebody's made a, a mistake and they've mm -hmm. and there's just something so precious about this connection to this earlier very human product this artifact I get a, a sense of awe if I am looking at a medieval manuscript or an early modern text and that's bad that we, we are told that that is fetishization we need to look at the text we need to analyze it we need to not be seduced by it I, th I think that's the same kind of thing that you're talking about it is absolutely and it's telling you to turn off a part of your your vivaciousness your because it's dangerous it's you're you're feeling an affinity with it you're falling in love with it you're falling in love and you know what lovers do they they disappear for weeks at a time right <laughs> they step away from the public and they're they're not being they're held to the same rules that 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 perhaps define the public good, mm -hmm. right? You're deviating and it's devious. And so we need more, we need more of that. And we need more opportunities in, in wild and reckless and unsafe spaces to, to, to fall in love with art and to, and to and to fall in love you know with the with the text and and bring our whole experience to bear and then when we find that we are making ourselves dizzy with too much emotion then we need to step back you know for me it's five feet four inches it's like all right what's going on here then there is a time, then there is the time to, to bring the tools of analysis. Absolutely, it has their place. But personal engagement with material is, is, is the way in. Why, why stand in the way of it? What's to be, what's to be gained? I've been asking that for more than 40 years you know, because I was constantly bludgeoned in, in graduate school. In fact, I kind of knew that once the, the um, arid, the, the most arid of the anti-aesthetics, once they set their sight on me, I realized, oh, I must be doing something well. <laughs> Otherwise, they wouldn't be picking on me right now. That's good. That's good. Um, yeah. Anyway, that your your experience that makes no sense to me. Yeah. There is no sense to be made from that. No, to to me, I, I I saw a pattern when when you spoke of those words of the problems with individualism, with meaning with formal elements and with beauty. I, I see a pattern of the, the, the growing ideology that, that has come from this radical despair of the postmodernists that anything we experience is, is really real, that it's all been socially constructed and that we need to deconstruct it 
from ourselves. And then as it's developed over the years into different kinds of theory, like critical race theory and queer theory and post-colonial theory and fat studies and all of the rest of it, then we have to be suspicious of ourselves. We always need to analyze ourselves and look at everything through these power dynamics. And this has only sort of strengthened since around 2010, escalating hugely in 2015, until there really is this um, puritanical feeling that if you are um, seeing meaning in anything, if you are being an individual, then what you are doing is reinforcing white um, Western um, meta narratives. The same um, issue with formal elements. Now, where does this come? Who, where do these categories come from? You know, in my my book, Cynical Theories, we said one of the things with with queer theory and then postmodernism was deconstructing these categories. We can only be free if we step outside these categories. And so if you're looking at, at formal elements, then you are, according to them, you'll be locking yourselves into these categories which are inherently oppressive, white and, and Western. And beauty, again, is, is something that we have constructed in order to serve the powerful. So this is how it, the, these came together in a pattern in my mind, looking at the, the theories that I've I've studied and how the ideology has changed over the years within the realm that I've looked at in the humanities and the, the social sciences. And I, it doesn't surprise me at all that the idea of meaning, individualism, form and beauty would be problematic. I can see um, from my understanding of the theories that why they, they would be. And I don't know if that makes sense to, to you or if um, you, you think there's, there's um, something else there. Does that, does that fit in with what you're seeing? Or? Oh, yes, that, that certainly fits in. What you're saying is true, but it does not make sense. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. It's all. It's anti-human, isn't it? it it's, it's anti-human, and um, and uh, it's it seems inauthentic to embrace such um, crisp, arid um, lattice work. I say, just blow it away. Just it's ashes. It feels like ashes to me. It's, um, it's, these are ideas that, you know, when I was in graduate school, I attempted to engage with just as an interesting um, astringent, if you will, in my conversations with um, some of the wonderful faculty at at my program and just to just to kind of to to provide a a, a counter to my own um, tendency which which is definitely um, more um, romantic it's romantic aesthetic and and uh, potentially um, sometimes to a degree that if I'm not careful can lack criticality and so, um, and so that's, you know, it's important um, for me to challenge that. And it's important for me to, to have um, conversations with, with friends who will bring to bear um, some, some challenges to me regarding my, my creative sensibility up until a point. But um, given that the complete hegemony of of the current theory is um just makes it um absolutely um this authoritarian shadow that's um 
nearly extinguishing light. Yeah. And so, <laughs> I mean, so I, I hedged when you asked me, you know, to talk about what art is. And I, and I, you know, I took a, I took a soft position quoting Supreme Court and quoting courts in Cincinnati. And, um, but, you know, personally for me, I, I think that art is, and the, the conti continuity from, you know, from the Plasticine period until now, I think that it's, it's about, it's about, it's about a light and, and, and that the, that the relationship that an artist <clears throat> attempts to establish with their work is they bring all their all of their means or I bring all of my means and my tools um, to to try to understand its nature. And what would you say, um, Melissa, to finish off to, to, to any young artist who is feeling themselves constrained, who is feeling feeling guilt or feeling that they 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 should restrain them themselves and they should be cynical and not believe in in meaning or beauty or uh, what what would you say to them i would say try it on <laughs> see how it feels be cynical be all those things if you want but reserve a place for writing where you then explore what that act feels like and and what you witness when you perform that and somewhere in between maybe your real life is there but in order to to find your place in art you have to explore that those moments of falseness and you need to you need to affix the beam as Wallace Stevens the great American poet would say you need to affix the beam of light upon that moment in which you participated in this false act and come to understand it there's a little bit of time right now I think I mean, I, I'm in a place where I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm older and I also have a full-time job and I, I'm super lucky in my job. There's no, no doubt about it. But in, you know, 1990, 91, when I first moved to New York, that was a terrible time for art, terrible time for painting. And I had numerous jobs working all the time and I had very little time for my art practice. So I'll speak from that moment because that's when I was a younger artist and I was definitely, definitely in a time of struggle. I found solitude and solace, solace, I mean, right? Um, in my irrelevance at that time. And I decided to claim liberty inside that irrelevance. And I used that time to go pretty deep with my work. And I eventually um, came out of that time period with, with you know, my first mature body of work. I was in my thirties. Um, right now, it's 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 such a horrible time for for art and for education. Um, I just um, I I see it as as a like as I'm talking about it. I see images, you know, and I just I just see art and education as, as like, you know, 
the patient you threw rice down upon the table. <laughs> it's really in bad shape. Um, but it may not take that much to revive. Uh, to revive education and um, and to revive art institutions. I, I foresee a forthcoming revolt of the artists. I think they may be our salvation. I, I, I strongly suspect they are the ones who will not allow us to go too far down this arid. I like that word that you use. It's, it's, it's a very good one for that, the whole feeling of what we're living through, the, this arid sort of path of, of, of Puritanism, of, um, of remaining within strict lines, of, of being cynical of, of, of everything, of, of working for the greater good to the detriment of, of humanity and, um, and creation. So I, I hope and I intend to help um artists to to do this to break free of this and i'm i'm very glad that you melissa Gwyn, are out there with your students encouraging them to explore and and take risks and be reckless <laughs> thank you helen <laughs>